Welcome to the Sent from Disneyland podcast. Here age relives fond memories of the past. If it's your first time joining us, welcome. On this podcast, we'll take a journey into the past and explore Disneyland and Disneyland history with mementos, snapshots, and postcards sent from Disneyland from 1955 to the present. The postcards from this episode will be viewable on Instagram at Sent from Disneyland or on my website, sentfromdisneyland.com. Today I'm starting off by thanking my patrons from patreon.com. You can join in and receive mail from my desk or for my trips to Disneyland. I'm currently working on some new patron benefits. Patrons can sign up for as little as a dollar per month. Special thanks to Random Olive, the first patron to this podcast, and to the e-ticket patrons to Nia, Eric Daniels, Monica Seats Vega, Joe Gamble, Scott Booker, Russ Romano, Michael and Christina Cross, Mary Henderson, and Sheila Harry. See ticket patrons, series inquiries only, Debbie Weinstein, Jennifer Schneep, Ruby McDowell, Grace Coat, Scott Cagle, Ben and Noel Bruning, and Patty Wool. B ticket patron, the Disney Rewind Podcast, and to the A ticket patrons, Elise Sharp, Zealot Infinity, Alexis Robles, Maggie and Henry Byers, Angelica Nablock, and the All Aboard Podcast. I am your host, your post host, Clocky, and today we have two postcards sent from Disneyland. The front of our first postcard has Main Street Station, with the Ernest S. Marsh pulling in a passenger car full of guests. You can see the floral Mickey, and in the upper right-hand corner it reads, Greetings from Disneyland. On the back it reads, Guests entering the Magic Kingdom are greeted by a floral Mickey Mouse and the Santa Fe and Disneyland Depot, where a scaled-down model of a passenger train of another era puffs out of the station to take them on a scenic tour of Disneyland. It's postmarked October 16th, 1970 with an Anaheim cancel and a six cent South Carolina 1670-1970 postage stamp, Scott number 1407. I assume they visit the park on Thursday, October 15th, when park hours were from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. The weather was a high of 75 and a low of 62. It's addressed to a Miss Annie Jutsum of Rochester, New York. It reads, 10 Hi, Annie. Kids of all ages love this place. Me too. From Alice's Friend in Wonderland. Since this episode is being released on September 24th and what would have been Jim Henson's 86th birthday, this week we'll look into Jim Henson and the Muppets at the Disney Parks. Reading Jim Henson, the biography by Brian J. Jones, James Maury Henson was born in Greensville, Mississippi in 1936. Jim is described in the book as always thinking into the future but he did distinctly remember seeing MGM's Wizard of Oz and Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarves at a young age. The latter started a lifelong admiration of Walt Disney and the Disney Company. Jim was also influenced by ventriloquist Edgar Bergen and the televised puppet show Kukula, Fran, and Ollie. These influences eventually led to the creation of the Muppets in the early 1960s and Sesame Street in 1969. The early days of the Muppets were filled with advertising on commercials and occasional guest spots on talk and variety shows. Sesame Street provided a steady environment for the Muppets to appear regularly in sketches on the show. The original plan for Sesame Street was to have human characters introduce segments and sketches with either Muppets or an animated skit. This was planned to separate fantasy from reality, but the Muppet and human world was quickly integrated to the current version of the show with Muppets interacting directly with kids and the human characters. In the mid-70s, Jim began working with Saturday Night Live producer Lorne Michaels, bringing new Muppets to late-night television. This was a big contrast to the family-friendly Muppets for PBS and the Children's Television Workshop. The Land of Gorge was a recurring segment on Saturday Night Live and only lasted a year. But leaving the show allowed Jim and the other Muppet performers to start producing The Muppet Show. The Muppet Show was modeled like other variety shows with a guest star, comedy sketches, songs, and had an overall plotline of Kermit and friends running the show with scenes set in the backstage of the theater. Jim always had an interest in partnering with Disney. The biography obtained notes written by Jim expressing his love for Disney films and even more a love for the Disney theme parks. In addition to enjoying Disneyland in Anaheim and the Magic Kingdom in Orlando, Jim traveled down to the newly opened Epcot a few months after its official ribbon cutting. Sunday sales are coming back. I'm excited to see what Enfield Post has in store every week for a special Instagram sale. I was recently sorting through my stamps and putting them in order of denomination, and I'm excited to backfill with some stamps from the next few weeks of sales. You can head over to EnfieldPost.com and explore all the different vintage stamps you can use on your next card or letter. That's E-N-F-I-E-L-D. 
P-O-S-T on Instagram and EnfieldPost.com for your wedding and vintage postage needs. Enfield Post is the official postage stamp sponsor of the Sent from Disneyland podcast. The front of our next postcard has the omnibus parked at the end of Main Street. You can see City Hall on the left, and on the right you can see the flagpole and a horse-drawn streetcar pulling up to board more guests. On the back it reads, Disneyland Omnibus. Disneyland's 5 8 scale double-decker omnibus carries hundreds of passengers daily on a fun-filled tour. Camera fans especially like the unique angles the omnibus's second deck provides. It's postmarked March 20, 1964, with an Anaheim March Red Cross Month cancel and a four-cent Lincoln postage stamp, Scott number 1036. I assume they visit the park on Thursday, March 19th, when park hours were from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. The weather was a high of 70 and a low of 54. Park attendance that day was 7,481. It's addressed to a Mr. and Mrs. Helvig Niebaum of Clinton, Iowa. It reads, L.A., March 19th, 1964. Hello again from this swell place. Just had a ride in the U-boat. Having a fine time. A meal is doing okay. And back home. Good. Be good from Orla. Hi from Bill. Hi, Emma and Helvig. Love, Esther. Prior to the eventual merger with Disney, Jim Henson had worked with Michael Eisner at ABC. Eisner had greenlit Muppet Show pilots during his time working in programming and development. Then, over a decade later, Jim proposed a deal for Disney to buy the Muppet franchise. Eisner initially passed on the deal, citing the Muppet brand was not large enough. Jim went back to work and produced new Muppet content using existing characters in a new format with the television cartoon show Muppet Babies and new Muppet characters in a new world called Fraggle Rock. This growth, plus a rebranding from Henson Associates to Jim Henson Productions, caught the eye of Eisner, and Jim was still interested in joining the Disney Entertainment family. The goal for Jim was to allow for more creative time while allowing the Disney company to handle the finance and business. Jim and Michael made a handshake deal, and Jim left for an interview on the Arsenio Hall show without mentioning the merger that would change his business. Jim liked the prospect of the Muppets at the Disney parks, and one of the first projects was made for the newest park in Florida, MGM Studios. Jim would direct and star in Muppet Vision 3D to open within a year after the official Disney Henson deal was announced. Another project planned was called The Great Muppet Movie Ride, but it never made its way out of the planning stages in Imagineering. Jim was impressed with the special effects used for the 3D attraction Captain EO and wanted Muppet Vision to provide a similar immersive experience. This included audio animatronic Muppets, squirting water towards the audience, bubbles floating down, and amazing wind effects. Unfortunately, Muppet Vision was delayed due to the death of Jim Henson at the age of 53. The MGM Studios attraction would delay its opening until May 16, 1991, exactly one year after Jim's passing. It was one of the last projects Jim worked on, along with the television special called The Muppets at Walt Disney World. When the Disneyland Resort opened Disney's California Adventure in 2001, Muppet Vision was included as an opening day attraction and was a replica of the Florida show. There was also talk about the Muppets taking over Disneyland and replacing the floral Mickey at the entrance to a floral Kermit. The story behind the change, that the Muppets would take care of Disneyland, allowing Mickey and friends to take a break after the 35th anniversary celebrations at Disneyland Park. The Muppets have made special appearances at the parks, including Muppet Mobile Labs with Bunsen and Beaker in a freestanding vehicle wandering Tomorrowland, also, the Muppets present Great Moments in American History, a show using the Hall of Presidents facade at Liberty Square in the Magic Kingdom. The most recent Muppet performance at the parks was in 2021 at the Merriest Nights special ticketed event for the winter holidays in Disneyland. The Muppets performed a mobile show on the omnibus down Main Street and back. I hope to see more Muppets around the parks in the future. This incoming postcard is sponsored by the Art Throwdown. Art Throwdown, or ATD, is an online craft hour on Instagram, starting at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 Pacific. Be sure to check out Monday's ATD, which is usually hosted by a paper artist, Russ Romano. I see many amazing art projects, learned about awesome postmarks, postage stamp history, and a lot more on different episodes. It's great to stop in for an hour to watch someone craft or design something unique. Each host brings something a little different to each show. I'll list some of the regular hosts, or you can follow Russ Romano 2021 on Instagram. The front of my incoming postcard has Cinderella Castle in the Magic Kingdom. You can see the reflection of the castle in the man-made river and guests walking over a bridge towards the castle. 
On the back it reads, Fairy Tale Castle, with its golden spires and fairy tale turrets reaching towards the clouds, Cinderella Castle marks the entrance to Fantasyland. It's not postmarked, but dated September 8, 2022, and has a pen cancel over a Canadian $1.30 2 oxen postage stamp. It reads, Hello from Ottawa. I found this in a vintage store that had a huge basket of postcards, and don't know if it's vintage. Clocky, I'll find out from you. Lol. Peace, Orla. Thank you so much for the postcard, Orla. It was interesting to have a postcard from this episode also include your name. Although this is not one of the original or 1970s postcards from Walt Disney World, it was likely produced in the 80s or 90s. And looking up definitions that qualify as vintage, the best breakdown I found was Antique is around 100 years old, Vintage falls between 40 and 60 years old, and Retro is 20 to 40 years old. I do like this postcard, and I also recently found one while antiquing or vintaging this summer. Thanks for listening to Sent from Disneyland. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and tell your friends. It would be awesome to share your favorite episode. There are over 100 episodes to choose from. It would also help to leave a 5-star rating and comment on whatever podcast platform you use. If you'd like to support the show financially, please check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash sentfromdisneyland. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook at sentfromdisneyland or on Twitter at sentfromdisney. For questions and comments, send me a postcard address to Sent from Disneyland, P.O. Box 44, Hood, California, 95639. This podcast is not affiliated with Disney, the United States Postal Service, or any post office or Disney properties. Opinions expressed on this podcast belong to its host and guest of the Sent from Disneyland podcast.